We're going to reconvene our meeting and shift gears and take up H126, an act relating to community resilience and biodiversity protection. First witness is Karen Horn. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, my name is Karen Horn. I'm with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And I'm here to testify on H126. Um, I did send a map from the Trust for Public Lands that was put together in August 2021 um, to the committee that you that um, sort of inform our testimony. I don't know if you've seen other maps at this point, but that's the one that I had available. Um, some of layers on the GIS map, but with my home internet is really not a possibility. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we do support the concept that effective and efficient contributions to conserving biological diversity and maintaining a landscape resilient to climate change is to conserve intact and connected ecosystems. We agree that supporting landowner education, technical assistance and programs, conservation easements to promote forest management and fee acquisitions of property will all contribute to climate resiliency and biodiversity. Those are some of the goals that are um, in your draft of uh, H-126. We also agree that housing is an enormous and equally immediate crisis which, current, which every currently sitting legislator campaigned on the need to resolve. The identified need for housing is 40,000 additional units, according to the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. According to the map that's provided by the Trust for Public Lands, lands currently conserved, quote, with some level of legal protection equal 1,655,279 acres. The goal of 30% conserved, according to that map and their um, definitions, is 1,000, 1,800,046, 218 acres. The additional acres that would need to be conserved to meet the 30% goal, according to the Trust for Public Lands map, is 190,000 acres. Um, we, we are concerned um, or curious maybe is a better way to put it about what the geographic representation or distribution of that <coughs> is across the state. Is, is it evenly um, distributed across the state? The TPL map incur includes current and completed trust for public land projects, federal, state, and local land, private conservation land, and the Appalachian Long and Catamount Trails. I'm not sure what a map would show as conserved if the criteria were, quote, meeting the definition of ecological reserve area, biodiversity con conservation area, or natural resource man management area as defined in this section, which is section three of your um, bill, H-126. Uh, and I, I would note that you also define in your definition section, you define sustainable forest management, but it's not actually used anywhere else in the legislation. So I'm not sure what the intent is with respect to uh, sustainable forest management. The TPL map does not show and H-126 would seem not to count the following areas of land that are off the table for development as a result of statutes, rules, and regulations, such as steep slopes, lands above 2,500 feet elevation, wetlands and wetland buffer areas, shoreland protection areas, lands in the use value system, waters of the state, certain floodplains, deer yards, and areas conserved pursuant to permit agreements with the state or Act 250 permits. We strongly suggest that you will need a full accounting of conserved land if before legislation is passed, establishing future conservation goals. 
the primary purpose of legislation at this point should be to collect all of that comprehensive picture of all protected areas in the state from all varieties of protected restrictions. You can use a lot of the data that is with the GIS Center. I hope you um, are going to have them in to, to uh, talk about the different layers of protected lands that they can show you. We contrast the land that's already conserved, 1.7 million acres, and the 30% goal of 1.8 million acres with the acres that according to discussions around housing should be available for that purpose. According to the Department of Housing and Community Development, all designated areas in the state comprise 41 square miles or 26,240 acres. Those are the compact settlement areas in which housing should be located according to the goals of the state and the state designation areas, if housing can be permitted in those areas. And that's a big if, given the constraints on the permitting of housing, opportunities for appeal, costs of construction, lack of labor, and a host of other issues. We've been working with the Senate Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs Committee on legislation that we hope will amend not only local zoning statutes, but also Act 250 and additional state permits. We're also supportive of H111 in the House General and Housing Committee, which would address workforce housing. And you have H68 here in your committee. We do think that the need for conservation to protect biodiversity and assure resiliency in our communities and providing 40,000 critically needed housing units can be met. We believe they cannot be met in isolation from one another and that one H126 needs to acknowledge the present housing crisis. I'm happy to take any questions and I will send this uh, to the committee. And I would urge you to take a look at that Trust for Public Lands map. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Representative Sedelia. Trust for Public Lands. We have not heard from them, have we? Did we hear from them? Um, not yet. Okay. We were going to invite them in. Okay. And can you, are, are you familiar with that structure? Can you just tell me a little bit about what? That is. <clears throat> what the Trust for Public Lands is. Yeah. It, it's a national nonprofit that is um, engaged in helping to conserve lands across the country, and they have an office here in Vermont. I mean, they've done excellent work, but that was the uh, that was the map that I could find that um, represented, you know, conserved lands and on one statewide map. Okay. Um, so, um, I thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks for coming in today, Karen. Um, so I'm, I'm not necessarily hearing that you don't support this. It sounds like what you support is. Uh, to do a full accounting, which, which frankly, I think that's what this is. I mean, this is a plan essentially to like look at all the, what we have, what we don't have, how, you know, what the tools are that are in the toolbox. Um, to me, it sounds like what you're asking is, just, is you know, make sure, make sure as you're thinking about that plan, planning process that you're also bringing in the lens of housing. Am, am I hearing you correctly? Uh, yeah, partly. So um, we're we're not supporting the bill at, at this point in time. We think that the bill needs to be specific that all kinds of protected areas, whether they're protected as a result of purchase or conservation easements or regulations such as wetlands. Um, wetlands, uh, you can't build in wetlands. They're a huge um, uh, proportion of the geography of the state. 
you need to look at those kinds of um, at those kinds of regulatory restrictions as well when you're coming up with the total acreage that's conserved in Vermont. And we think it's very important that this bill also acknowledge the need for housing um, in, in some respect and speak to the 40,000 units. Uh, we, we find the fact that you've got 1.7 million acres um, conserved at this point and 26,000 acres, uh, which are where you're encouraged to build housing is um, pretty out of balance, to be perfectly frank. Representative Stemmen. Thanks. I guess um, in my experience, regulations can be changed. And so if what we're really looking at is, is something really set aside or not, I, I don't know that I mean, I just think about like, not necessarily in Vermont, at the federal level, I mean, we have regulations this way, four years later, we have them this way, then we have this way. And so I, I guess I would push back a little bit and, and ask you your opinion, if you you really see regulations as being um, permanent. We, uh, well, you can also change any statute and this legislature has in the past. You can you could change any statute at any time. Um, we think that the regulations that uh, protect some of these, these kinds of um, lands and waters, such as the, reg, the, the wetlands, the steep slopes, the <coughs> elevations over 2,500 um, feet, they've been in place for decades and um, they've they've expanded, not contracted. So I, we think it's really important to look at those lands. If you wanted to say conserved lands, category A, regulatory pro protected lands, category B, you, you could differentiate that way, but we think it's very important to include those lands. It's an incomplete picture otherwise. Okay. Thank you. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, 30, but 30, 30, and 50, 50 is part of this uh, resilience, H126. I believe you had a map here that showed different, or maybe it wasn't your map, but somebody that showed different parts of the state that are a certain percentage that have are trying to achieve this. And the Northeast Kingdom is 43% and Chittenden County is 8%. That does get to the issue of geographic distribution of protected lands. Sure. So do you think that this bill is going to be concentrating on mostly the Northeast Kingdom because that's the only place to conserve what's left? Oh, well, Central Vermont's a good place also. No, <laughs> Southern Vermont. <laughs> but um, I, I think there certainly is a, a risk that that those lands, well, it's going to be easier to conserve lands where there's less pressure for development and essentially the costs of um, acquiring or conserving are, are less. So it, it's unlikely, in, in our opinion, that Chittenden County would end up with the bulk of those conserved lands. That's my thoughts as well. All right. Thank you. Representative Sevilla. Yeah. Uh so one of the things that I've been kind of tuning in on as we've been talking about this are definitions. So I've heard you talk about protected mm -hmm. versus conserved. And we have permanently conserved, which is something else, I think. But um, can you tell me what you believe the difference is between protected and conserved? So, so you, the bill... Um, would define conserved lands, and it has these three categories uh, of um, lands that are that are considered conserved. So, ecological reserve areas, biodiversity conservation areas, or nat natural resource management areas. But protected is my word. It's not. I don't believe defined in the statute. Certainly not in the bill. But what we mean by that is the, those areas that are off the table for development because of things like rules and regulations and um, agreements with Act 250 permits and, and those kinds of uh, 
things. Okay. So I just want to, I don't know that the bill defines conserved as those three types of land. I think it defines those three types of land as permanently conserved, but I don't know if it defines what conservation is. Is that the case? Is that the case? It has a definition of conserved. It, it does. Yeah. Okay. Conserved, there it is. Oh, is that yeah, section three? Yeah, okay, it does. So conserved means permanently conserved. And and the and just to follow on that, Representative, is that the um, the definition of sustainable forest management um, is in the bill, but what's the context in which that is going to be used? Because it, it's not referenced when you get farther down in the bill. I could that is Karen. Yeah. Pardon the the definition. Um, well, in your definition section, it has sustainable forest management. Yes, it does. Okay, great. For some reason, okay. I missed definition. Thank you. Yep. Further question? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Molly Mahar. Welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify this morning on H126. I'm Molly Mahar. I am president of the Vermont Ski Areas Association. We're a nonprofit association representing 20 alpine and 28 cross country ski areas across Vermont. Ski areas are not only major economic drivers and employers for the rural communities where most of them are located, but skiing is also an important part of the state's tourism, heritage, and culture. And ski areas have successfully conserved and protected lands through master planning and careful management to benefit our state, its natural resources, and the environment over many decades. Ski areas are part of Vermont's working landscape. We are stewards of the land and the managers take this responsibility very seriously, spending millions of dollars in planning and permitting to accomplish this to support our recreation uh, economy. Outdoor recreation is an important gateway for many people, both Vermonters and visitors, to understand the importance of our environment and why it should be protected. Skiers come to the mountains for recreational opportunities, certainly, but also to experience the mountain environment, and we strive to manage that environment properly so that people will continue to visit and the capacity to support and promote outdoor recreation will be enhanced. We broadly support the goals of H126 and believe that a more diverse and connected ecosystem is more resilient, that conserved and managed lands can help to mitigate climate change through carbon storage and sequestration, and that maintaining habitat connectivity in Vermont is key to maintaining habitat connectivity for the region. Um, that said, we want to make sure that you uh, understand some of the unique characteristics of the environment in which ski areas work and the issues that we are focused on for the future. Um, Vermont ski areas exist on privately owned lands, uh, state lands, and federal lands, and often combinations of private and um, state and private and federal land. And while Act 250 governs the use, development, management, and protection of lands where ski areas operate, Often, state and federal land use policies govern their, their management as well. And a great example of that is ski areas that operate on or, or partially on state lands must file, seek approval for, and manage to annual stewardship plans. And the same is true for areas on federal lands. So ski areas are managed using an array of tools, which include permanent conservation by fee ownership, or easements by the state or the U.S. Forest Service, or as you heard from ANR last week, through Act 250 and the ANR permitting processes, which impose conditions that govern ski area operations. We support the use of the widest array of conservation programs and tools be used towards achieving the goals in H-126 because the regular, regulatory process does provide significant protection for the lands, wildlife, and plant species that are on private, state, and federal lands where ski areas operate or adjacent to where we operate. 
And last week you heard from Mr. Austin, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife, who indicated that the department working with ski areas through Act 250 and ANR permitting processes over many decades has resulted in significant permanent conservation as well as permit conditions that guide how ski areas are operated in harmony with the goals of ANR and support in support of the lands and wildlife resources that we seek to protect. Mr. Austin also indicated that there have been efficiencies created in the permitting process because of our longstanding work with the department. So we agree that efficiencies can happen, particularly in the master planning process when looking at the big picture planning for future development, management, and conservation. And conservation or planned conservation of larger parcels of land is more predictable for us and preferred in contrast with piecemeal conservation in the context of, in, of permitting individual projects. Master planning is a lengthy and expensive process for ski areas to undertake, but they view this positively as proactive and necessary work. Businesses really like certainty and the ability to plan is how ski areas achieve good outcomes. They increase their certainty by creating a framework for individual projects um, to reside under, as well as a framework to, to ensure that the ski area, the local community, the region, and the state uh, have a vision of and agree on the goals and preferred outcomes. So looking now to the future, we've seen the ANR's scope of review and their resource tools have been evolving and a lot of focus is now at the landscape level of the largest forest blocks and connecting habitat. And this is a much broader view and this bill would direct ANR to prioritize land conservation in the future to meet the goals of the bill. And this creates uncertainty for ski areas uh, and it would be beneficial for us to understand how the agency will prioritize areas for conservation and make sure that we participate in any stakeholder process. This is the same observation we've made when we've talked about forest fragmentation during prior legislative sessions. And it's unclear how ANR and other stakeholders will prioritize lands for conservation and protection because if we look at ANR's maps of forest blocks and connecting habitat right now, the land area identified, identified is very large and even includes some ski areas. So just like in a ski areas master planning process, we need to have a vision of the state's conservation goals and an understanding of the plan to get there. So in closing, um, we do support the broad goals of H-126, but would advocate, um, number one, that the widest array of conservation programs and tools um, should be available to reach these goals. And two, advocate for a process in which we would participate where stakeholders can have input um, into how we will focus our collective efforts to determine how lands are prioritized for conservation, either through permanent conservation or in other ways like regulatory processes. And right now that future vision is unknown and something we hope that H-126 could help to create and clarify. So we're advocating for a process where stakeholders can work with the state to create more certainty around where these lands are that we want to protect and how we can work to get there together. Thank you. Answer any questions or try to. Thank you for your testimony. Do members have questions? Representative Tory. I actually just have a comment. I, I want to thank you for your testimony because I feel like you clarified a lot about the goals of this act. And I think a lot of people have been confused um, because of that landscape view. And we are going to be taking more testimony as we go on um, to learn more about the wide array of tools that exist now. Um, so yeah, thank you for putting it in those terms that are accessible. Thank you. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, thank you. There's a bill somewhere in the house right now uh, to preserve country club golf courses from development. Uh, are you familiar with that at all? I have read it, but I have not. I, I would need to go back and, and look at I it. I don't know how many ski areas have uh, golf courses. I know Jay does. And I'm just wondering what your take was going to be on that. You, you know. Yeah, I would have to look at it again, I think. Yeah. I'll ask that another time. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'll go back and do my homework. Okay. I'm going to say that was constructive testimony. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thanks for your testimony. All right. Thank you for your time. So we have Amber Perry. Good morning. Thank you for having me today. 
My name is Amber Perry and I'm the Vermont Farm Bureau Policy Director. Um, we just have some language concerns with H126. The first one being on page line, on page six, line five, uh, long term. The term long term concerns us. We also are concerned with on how this will impact the forest land that is currently in current use programs. Um, we also have seen that the bill is being submitted for review or the plan is being submitted for review to the following committees, House Ag and Food Resiliency, Forestry, House Environment and Energy, um, and Senate Natural Resources. And we would ask you to consider bringing Senate Agriculture in as well. We support the idea of the initial inventory of permanent conserved land here in Vermont. We also would support the summary of conservation practices, especially for all private landowners. On page eight, lines 19 and 20, we would like to thank you for the addition of private owners of forest land and agricultural land. Um, that is all we have for today. Um, we'll be looking for language changes and we look forward to coming in if need be later. All right, thanks. Um, can we rewind to your very first question or concern, page six, line five? The long term. I might have the wrong draft up here, but. Um, the area, but that is subject to long term sustainable what, forest management. For, um, Low term, long term. Yeah, go ahead, Representative. Sure. Can you like, can you, is it is it that it's unclear what long term means? Yeah. Is it is it that there is that concern forever? that it could be forever, yes, or what? That is the concern that it could mean forever. Okay. Representative Bongar. Just to be clear, you do recognize that. This is all about willing landowners making the decision. Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, other questions? Okay. Thanks for your testimony. Um, next up, we have Sam Lincoln. Welcome, Mr. Lincoln. Thank you. Morning, all. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today uh, and testify on H-126. Um, for the record, my name is Sam Lincoln. Um, because I don't represent an organization, I'm here as an individual today as a rural landowner and a rural uh, forest economy business owner. Just a brief background uh, about myself and my, my family's uh, business. Um, I own and operate a master logger, certified logging operation in central Vermont. Um, part of a multi-generational family that owns farm and forest land. We've been dairy and cash crop farmers, loggers, maple producers. Uh, my, my wife's family also has operated a sawmill. At their peak, my agricultural enterprises have done business with up to 80 farmers uh, a year, dairy, beef, and equine farmers. Um, I've worked on timber harvesting projects for over 50 individual landowners in the last 25 years in central Vermont. Many of them repeat clients during that time. Three of them uh, past former legislators. Um, and part of that generated millions of dollars in revenue uh, for my business and for those landowners. Um, and I would conservatively estimate, es estimate that I have uh, spent 16,000 hours working in the forest of Central Vermont. I served six years on the Development Review Board uh, in Randolph, the following a year and a half on the Planning Commission. I served as a private sector representative on the Forest Fragmentation Study Committee for Act 171 in 2016. In 2017, I was appointed by Governor Scott to serve as Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation <coughs> on Forest Economy Policy, during which time I reviewed Vermont conservation design and provided feedback to the authors. Uh, though there are many subjects I would enjoy the opportunity to speak about uh, with you all, um, I would like to discuss the stewardship uh, of rural land and defining conservation in re relation to the goals of H-126. To be clear right up front, I support land conservation in the many different forms and the goals of Vermont conservation design. Um, I recognize that H-126 is a plan of, uh, to, to uh, achieve voluntary conservation and it's not a mandate. Um, I have concerns about how the plan is to be developed, starting with landowners. Looking at the maps uh, of Vermont conservation design and where the priority areas are, uh, 
I believe it's important to recognize that the millions of acres on the landscape that are they're un, under private land ownership and they're undeveloped in a wide range of shapes and sizes. There are many forms of conservation and easements and ownership, but millions of acres of those acres remain on what I would refer to as conserved land due to the stewardship ethic and culture of rural Vermonters. These parcels of land have been transferred from generation to generation by people who saw the highest and best value in the land as working it and conserving it. That's the reason that it is ripe for conservation today is because people for generations and centuries have seen value in it, not with, a, with buildings on it, with, with managing it. Um, as science awareness, outreach and education has evolved, these landowners also recognize the value of this land for biodiversity and as ecologically important areas. My sons will, and my wife's and my sons will be the fifth and ninth generations respectively from our families to own land in Vermont. And we don't, uh, we, we, again, we consider our land to be conserved because it's part of our family culture and ethic that, and um, adding values to the commodities raised on the land ha has that centuries old track record um, with remarkable progress and, and without the need for permanent restrictions on the land. The forest landowners that I work with have uh, several characteristics that I've understood over the past 25 years. They are enrolled in the use value appraisal program. They have many goals for management of their land other than generating revenue from timber sales, but the income is important consistently to all of them. They make decisions about their land use based on practical information and best practices that they've learned from interactions with a licensed consulting forester, the county forester, they may have been to a Vermont Woodlands Association walk in the woods, a Vermont Coverts retreat. They read or learned about ecosystem protection from a source they trust. They've enrolled in a USDA program that incentivizes wildlife habitat enhancement. They want and need flexibility within best practices and within their bundle of private property rights to make decisions that work for them. They're paying mortgages on the land, they're paying taxes on the land, and they are an incredibly important part of land conservation. The witness list for this bill so far has included many talented professionals, but I have seen very few private landowners um, and without their participation and buy-in, this level of conservation can advance and particularly if it's voluntary. I encourage the committee to hear from landowners across Vermont about the challenges they face and how they would implement these goals. The concepts in H-126 do not appear to have been drafted with private landowners' needs in mind, which I believe is a significant oversight. The word landowner only appears two times in the draft, once in the findings and once in the development of the plan. Um, I believe that asking for landowners to provide input through a comment period or during three public meetings so another entity, another body can draft the plan for the conservation of their land is, is not respectful to the, the multiple generations that people have made this millions of acres of kept this land undeveloped. If, if I was, and if I was tasked with that, I would, I would re-situate the chairs at the table uh, in the planning process. The economics of land conservation, planning for the cost of conservation at this scale is not addressed in the bill. Tax assessment for permanent conservation of the land at this scale uh, is not addressed in the bill or directed to be addressed. Um, talking about sustainable forest management. As you heard Bob Zano say, the most efficient way to achieve young forests and create the habitat is through forest management, which works in conjunction with how landowners have already been sustaining and managing their forests for generations. Implementing sustainable forest management is not a switch that can be flipped on and off. It requires massive capital investment, diverse markets, and a very skilled workforce. The forest economy supply chain that enables this type of management is undergoing significant disruptions, both economic and natural, and this, implement, this implementation tool is at risk. I encourage you to look to the work of the Forest Futures Roadmap that is uh, currently um, charting out those issues and, and potential solutions as part of the um, a bill last year. When we're discussing land use and the conservation categories, um, please remember that the output of sustainable forest management activities are the forest products that are manufactured into essential human needs. Traditional building materials, food packaging, medical supplies, energy for homes and institutions, an endless list. And we learned at the beginning of the pandemic just how essential those products are when supply chains started being cut off. Not producing them here 
losing the raw material supply only externalizes the use and consumption of that resource to another part of the globe. Not cutting trees here does not result in a net decrease of cutting trees on the planet. Landowners are receiving $27 million a year annually in stumpage payments for forest management activities, which has in itself, in itself an indirect conservation effect. Forest management activities in Vermont with the highest standards of sustainability and ecosystem protection during planning and implementation, public lands, timber sales, and timber harvest that include chip harvesting for wood fuel are currently under threat in other policy discussions. Regarding the definition of sustainable forest management, my request is that that term would be defined by the Commissioner of Department, the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. Um, I encourage the committee to look at other model programs uh, in land conservation, for example, um, public and private conservation work, such as Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, Vermont Land Trust, and many others in that conservation uh, category. They give landowners wide lanes to make choices uh, and work alongside them in choosing best practices. Um, I'd also encourage you to take a look, uh, and I'll send it in my notes to the committee assistant, that the Watershed Agricultural Council in New York is a program that is, uh, uh, provides the protection of the drinking water supply for New York City's 9 million residents. And that, that water, watershed protection was developed um, because they clearly knew that they could not go buy up all the land needed to protect all that water. They couldn't conserve it all. So there's research done, there's outreach, technical assistance, and direct conservation programs that are done in that watershed. And it has improved the viability of the working lands enterprises there through cost share programs and practical research that helps those business owners be more viable economically and logistically. Um, and um, I encourage you to take a look at that again as a model program that becomes a very large win-win for the, for the participants. Um, I also um, encourage you to look at solutions that work for landowners at their kitchen table. When they've reached a permit office to apply to subdivide their land, we've, we've lost the battle. The, the landowner, uh, people are not greedy. I, I literally in 25 years, I think I've done two house lot clearing projects. The rest of it has been for landowners that want to keep their land undeveloped and managed, um, but they need money. There's large holding costs, uh, things like that. Please consider things, uh, as, as you consider these things, look at conservation subdivisions that allow landowners to um, maybe have a higher density, smaller lot sizes, putting um, the subdivided parcels that they need some, some cash equity out of their land, but also allow larger blocks of land to be conserved and create access for forest management, agricultural management, or, or there may be some of these other categories you've defined in here. Um, with that, I'll, I'll pause and thank you for the opportunity to, to present my uh, information and take questions happily. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I, if it's possible for you to submit the written testimony as a follow-up, that would be great. So I will. We can refer back to it. Um, I will. Thanks. Representative Stebbins. Thank you, Manager. Um, thanks, Mr. Lincoln, for coming in. Um, so we have uh, two places in here that basically say how this is going to get done. I mean, more it, it's fleshed out more than two, but basically it says the secretary shall develop this plan. Um, and then it also says uh, in developing the plan, the secretary shall hold, as you mentioned, not less than three public meetings on the plan and accept public comments. The secretary shall solicit input from various stakeholders, including private owners of forest lands, ag lands, land trusts, Vermont Housing Conservation Board. So my question is, um, uh, are, are two part. First, are you aware of the effort that started this past summer with VHCB pulling, um, you know, various stakeholders together to start thinking about this and looking at that? And if you are, does that process feel um, like a uh, um, a real process for input from landowners um, because I, I think that that is at least what I've been thinking just me 111th of the committee is that that would be sort of somewhat the process that this bill might continue to uh, work along I'm not, uh, I, I'm very familiar with VHCB. I'm only loosely familiar with what the, the, the conversation you're talking about. Um, I, I probably think the, the only way I could uh, um, 
uh, appropriately testify to that is that that VHCB is a vehicle in Vermont that has obviously done the conservation work and also the technical assistance work that goes down to the boots on the ground producer level, uh, helping the viability of those farms. So some, somewhat of a, um, not necessarily a mirror of the Watershed Ag Council in New York, but similar. So, um, but to your direct question, I don't think I'm familiar enough with that effort to say, um, to give you an, an informed response. So. So. Um, so just a, a follow up, I guess um, I can understand your concern um, in terms of how this is drafted. And I guess there's there's always a balance between how much language you put in um, as to what the process is in reality. Um, if you don't mind, I, it, uh, could I like connect you with the person who's running that and maybe hear from you about whether or not that seems like an appropriate path? Because I. I, I mean, I we definitely need to have private landowners as part of this conversation. It it's clearly cannot be, you know, a secretary going off and looking at some plans, which it wouldn't be. But I just want to make sure that um, we're making it clear enough that we would be hearing from landowners. I'd be very happy to. Okay, thanks. Um, a couple of just maybe points of clarification. Um, the definition for sustainable forest management did come from the previous commissioner. That, that is. We worked this through last year. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, um, and um, actually, you, I think I heard you say planning for cost of conservation at, at this scale is not accounted for. Actually, that is one of the points of this is, um, you know, the way that I envision this is that we are currently investing in conservation and um, the groups that are actively participating in doing conservation kind of already use Vermont conservation design. The overarching goals are the conservation of 80% of Vermont species. Um, and so it's less about like a priority list. It's not going to be that scale of a plan. It's really a touchstone plan for the legislature to say, you know what, this is really important. We have this, you know, where are the gaps? Literally, where are the gaps? The biophysical region gaps, which were referenced in the previous witnesses' testimony, um, and acknowledge them sort of like eyes wide open. How much will it cost for us to keep a functioning landscape for future generations? Um, but that's, that's the way I envision this coming across. If I may, is, is there a reference to that Accounting for that cost, I guess I, I missed that. If it, there's a it's a deliverable in the plan, um, and it may need more clarification. Okay. So I'm not discounting your comment because of because of that, but I'm I welcome <coughs> specific you know clarification points. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Right. With that, um, do members have further discussion? I'm going to remind everyone, including myself, we're coming back at 1 today, not 1.15. I think that's today. Do I have that right? Yeah. Maybe 1 o'clock. So I do have a question. Okay. And I apologize. Uh, for witness, but for? Well, maybe for uh, our witness, uh, two of them brought up, and I apologize for having a coughing fit there. Um, Karen Horn asked about uh, the sustainable forest management, why that definition is in there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Did we have, and, and Madam Chair, I don't recall if we had testimony about why that would be in there, how it relates, connects to the um, rest of the bill. So we have definitions, we have goals, and then we have a plan, and now I'm going to start coughing. So how does that Connect. That was also added um, by the previous commissioner during testimony last year of the definition of sustainable. Um, yeah, page six. I'm on page six, yes. I'm just wondering uh, what is gained or lost in having that, how it's connected to the rest of the bill. Um, I think it's in the definition of the third category, yeah. Oh, to long-term sustainable forest. So then the question was, what is it? And so then we defined yeah. it. Okay, great. That's where it comes from. And, okay. Uh, 
terms of uh, that definition and causing damage to other ecosystems? Do we have, like, who would we hear from on that? Six. Yeah, page six, line 10. <clears throat> so sustainable forest management. So what, who could we learn from about what type of forest practices cause damage to other ecosystems? I guess that's my question better articulated. And have we heard? Should I go back and for Um, We could invite in the current commissioner. Okay. <clears throat> All right, further questions or discussion? Not seeing any. With that, we will adjourn um, Vermont Legislature's House Committee on Environment and Energy. And this afternoon, we are going to start off by talking about H67, an act relating to household products containing hazardous substances. We have Steve Dwinell with us from the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Welcome, Mr. Dwinell. Thank you. Um, so we had some specific, well, we, we hadn't heard from the agency yet on this bill, so we'd love to just hear your thoughts, and then I think we do have specific questions for you. Yeah. Well, uh, I think as you've heard from other uh, witnesses, that she's interested in increasing the funding level that we currently have for the uh, reimburse the solid waste management entities on their disposal of pesticide waste that they collect in their household house waste program. <laughs> um, you know, we have some, we have obligation under the law, uh, under Title VI, to operate a that's a, a collection program for waste pesticides. What are they? Okay, can you tell us a little bit about the money that, so right now pesticides have to register by pesticide type is my, our understanding. Just give, you, give us the framework well, of what's happening. Yeah, and so, so products are registered, excuse me. Products are registered. Uh, each individual pesticide product has to be registered individually. They pay a $200 annual registration fee. Certain portions of that are allocated to certain things. I think $15 goes to the wet water quality uh, program and $25 goes to various programs for education on environmental issues, dairy program, that kind of thing. Then the rest is kind of it's not it's not specified in the statute, you know, how the rest is allocated. That's allocated, I assume, through the budget process. I one thing I should point out is I've been in this position since the beginning of October and I haven't been through a budget process yet. So there's a lot I don't know how it actually gets allocated, but uh, we work very closely with our budget office. Uh, they keep track of the budget and make sure we're within our expenditure limits and everything. And so when I became aware of the uh, issue with the solid waste uh, districts not being reimbursed fully for the disposal of the hazardous of the, the pesticides that are collected. I asked the uh, business office if there was any opportunity to increase the funding level. And they, they took a look at it and said, yeah, they think they can for this, for at least next year, maybe the year after with the money we have available. So the, you know, so basically the money comes in, it goes into a fund, it gets allocated through the budget process. My understanding is the last several years or the last grant cycle it was on the order of $70,000 a year for a four-year grant cycle. Um, Is that total or per swimming? Total. total. Okay. Um, so 280000 approximately for the, all for the whole program for the state over four years. Oh, I see. So 70000 a year. And looking at the information we were hearing from the districts, um, it seems like if we doubled that amount, we're going to 140000 a year for a four-year grant period. So, you know, about $560,000, that should, should cover the costs that they have been identified to us so far. And you said for sort of the next year or two, um, but this has been a chronic problem. Right. Or, yeah. So you're, are you saying that because you, you have a, is, has the fund built up over time or is it well ongoing revenue pay for this? There's two things. There's a, there's a, you know, well, and I don't know the exact number because like I said, I haven't been through that process, but there is a. According to our budget off, there's a, you know, we are taking a little more than we're spending for this year and projected for next year. Plus, we have some, what we anticipate, some reduced expenditures coming up. One of the, um, one of the items that the money is used for is support the Vermont Agriculture Environmental Lab, VAIL Lab. And we, in conversations with colleagues, we understand that the cannabis control board is going to start renting space there to do work that they need to do so that reduces the amount of money that has to come out of the pesticide fund to support the lab 
and the difference will support increasing the funding for for the solid waste districts over time over time now and and you know i i can't tell you how much it's going to be three years from now but we, i think what we need to do is you know work closely with the solid waste districts to figure out what their costs are make sure we have the funding for it if we need funding we'll have to figure that out but part of the issue i think is that you know there should be very little pesticide waste <laughs> i mean it's it's a product a pesticides are designed to be used and applied and if they're applied the way they're intended to be used or to label they're not a waste so if we have an issue with products showing up in the hazardous waste stream there's there's a disconnect there and that's one of the things i'm interested in doing is more education not just for the um consumers but also for the agriculture community and all the other pesticide users to avoid that problem i mean if you know in the past um, one more item of information that's pertinent i guess is i basically had the same position in florida for about 30 years and um, before i moved up here and we had a pesticide waste disposal program that a lot of states do but a lot of those programs originally started because there was a round of uh, pesticide cancellations you know, in the 90s for products that were no longer could be used. And so they were canceled, they were ending up, um, you know, EPA has rectified a lot of that with their product registration process. They don't allow those kinds of products in the marketplace anymore. So there shouldn't be that much <laughs> if, it, if they're being handled correctly. And that's, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I uh, goal, I guess, would be to work with the districts and However, whoever else extension to, to educate people that you know pesticides do not have to become waste if you use them according to the way they're labeled to be used you don't have the waste and then you don't have the expense of having to dispose of them. Mm -hmm. okay. so <clears throat> i think i understand you haven't said this yet but right now our bill is including class c yes mm -hmm. pesticides mm -hmm. and that okay with the agency what do you well uh, that was what we proposed to the uh, dec was to, to just take out the a and b and just leave the c in there um if we're successful if, if we can work out an arrangement with the solid waste districts and they're happy with the amount of funding that we're coming up with i taking class c completely out of the bill would make sense because we'd have a way to to uh uh, pay for them through the other through another program right um what is what do you think your time frame would be on kind of coming to that agreement well we have a meeting tuesday <laughs> okay yeah i mean we're trying to do this so the other issue here or the other item uh, i guess to consider is that the grants we have that are in place now expire in june of this year and so we would be rewriting them for the next uh fiscal year okay do members have, thank you for your testimony. Sure. Do you have anything else you need, wanted to add? No, sure. Do members have questions? Wait, Representative Munger. Just, just to pull it apart a little bit. Uh, if you're using, if you have just a little bit of money left over now, right. gaining a little bit of rent isn't gonna make much difference. So where's the, do you actually have the money to pay the swimmies what it's actually gonna, what it actually cost them? That's my anticipation based on the numbers I've seen. Yeah. That if you know the so the the numbers that were provided to the agency for the re grant requests for the last grant cycle were basically double what they are now. So that's what I've talked to the business office about is doubling the amount, which should cover that. And then of course, like I was just talking about, I'd like to work to reduce the amount. I mean, this is, it shouldn't be a growing problem. Right, it should be reduced. It should be reducing as opposed to growing. Other questions? Representative Sebelia then Stemmen. Just clarification. So I'm hearing that you are meeting with the Swimmies yes. uh, Tuesday. Yes. And is it your expectation like that there will be some sort of final agreement on how to proceed there? Uh, well, what I would and what I hope to accomplish at that meeting is to come to an agreement on the fact that we're going to increase the funding 
at the level that we can sustain and that would meet the swimmies need and that would result in not having to include pesticides in the in the um, age 67 so that we can basically take care of the problem with existing programs without having to create a whole other infrastructure to deal with it what's your confidence level that you have enough money to uh solve this problem but i have to rely on what the business office said and they said we did okay uh, that would be my answer yes i have seven zimbo guards thanks madam chair um, I think ideally, like if we could right size the containers more and, and then you're right, we would see less of this product needing to be disposed of. Mm -hmm. um, but I would imagine there might be a time frame during the interim where if you're increasing public education and outreach, you might see more. Um, and so just to push a little bit more, although I realized you're going to the business office, you know, that's where you're going, but right. does it make any sense to say, to, to, to put in, uh, you know, a buffer initially, because if you have more public out education and outreach to make sure you're capturing that and then, you know, track the reduction and then you could also track the, the budget reduction. Well, I, I, one way we could potentially do that is to, in the grant cycle, you know, have more money up front and less money toward the end of the cycle. It's a four-year grant cycle. So, you know, and obviously can't predict the future of the, or the costs associated with that. But, um, I mean, the only way I can think we could deal with that is we just keep and if it looks like we're the costs are still going way up, then we'd have to come up with another solution. Further questions? Just um, we, we talk about dealing with the waste from these products. Right. Are you is the agency looking at keeping them out of the system altogether? Like, what are are we really looking at ways to because rather than just deal with the, with the waste, the, the idea would be not even have it being used in the first place in many instances. Are we doing anything to think along those lines of how to get some of these products just out of a model altogether? Well, I mean, they're, they're, we have a product registration process. As, as you know, Representative, we just adopted the rule, uh, the, pest, the Mont rule for the control of pesticides just was updated. It includes a, more streamlined, I guess, way of classifying the products. And so the materials that would be available as class C for homeowners are materials that are you know, relatively low toxicity, low concentration, ready to use formulations. Um, and those are you know, things like disinfectants and, and um, uh, you know, low concentration garden materials, things like that. The other materials, the class A and the class B, are higher concentrated. They're intended for people who are certified to use them. Um, the you know the amount of material that is used in the state depends on a lot of factors, including the crops that are grown, the pest pressures that are there, the change, you know, changes in climate. I mean, there's so many factors that it's hard to say. Uh, I will say that you know relative to historical pesticide use, the materials that are registered at the federal level and the state level are markedly different than they were 20 years ago in terms of toxicity and persistence. And, and so that's the trend, you know, with materials that are less curious. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming in. <clears throat> All right, members, we're gonna shift gears again back to H126, an act relating to community resilience and biodiversity protection, and we're going to welcome Jens Hawkins-Hilka. Welcome. Thank you. You on your mic off? This mic is off, yes. 
Um, <clears throat> um, Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Jens Hilke. I'm a conservation planner with Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. I was asked to come in and speak about using the BioFinder uh, web app and the Atlas. Um, I, am, uh, I have a presentation uh, prepared and I'm happy to share that with you. Uh, for those of you who might choose to follow along on your iPads or tablets, everything I'm saying today will should work for you. <laughs> so, uh, so feel free to follow along uh, on your iPads. Um, so uh, before I get too far along, I just wanted to say that uh, I, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, we believe in the conservation of fish, wildlife plants, and their habitats for the people of Vermont. That's a big mission that takes us in <gasps> different directions. I coordinate the department's community wildlife program. So I provide technical assistance to all 268 municipalities and 11 regional planning commissions. I've been doing this work since 2006. Uh, I've visited and worked with probably about 200 of the 268 towns. Um, and uh, I get around uh, for my share of night meetings. Uh, overwhelmingly, this work uh, involves the use of the BioFinder and the Vermont conservation design. Um, first and foremost, BioFinder is a website. So if again, if you're following along, please just Google BioFinder. It might take you to the web page, uh, in which case you'll need to hit launch map uh, and will actually take you to the mapping interface. So BioFinder is a website. It is accessible to everyone. Uh, there is not password protected. Uh, it is uh, universally available. Um, it is uh, a set of maps. It's also a toolbox. So uh, we won't be getting into the, uh, the higher level tools today, uh, but that toolbox allows users to interact with the data, share the data uh, with others, uh, draw on the maps, uh, export shape files of their drawings. So it allows for a type of spatial communication uh, between volunteers. And again, at the municipal level, we're talking about a huge number of volunteers. Uh, it allows for spatial communication among volunteers that was really unheard of 10 years ago. Uh, most importantly, perhaps, BioFinder is a prioritization. Uh, it expresses the lands and waters that are most important uh, for Vermont's ecological function uh, today and into the future. Uh, now, uh, the data that is on the BioFinder website, when you first turn it on, you'll see this map with dark green and light green. That's the prioritization side of BioFinder. And that data is called Vermont Conservation Design. I know you've heard from other uh, experts in the department and, uh, and citizens uh, about Vermont Conservation Design. Um, we'll, we'll be hitting some of those same points today, but I just wanted to emphasize that VCD is the data, BioFinder is the website. Um, the, the Vermont Conservation Design data is available to you on BioFinder, but you can also access it through the Atlas, through the Vermont Open Geo Data Portal. Uh, they're all, all manner of uh, avenues to access the VCD data. I would recommend BioFinder. It was made for that purpose. Um, but again, you can access BioFinder Atlas uh, VCD data on the Atlas. Um, the Atlas, the ANR Atlas, is a separate mapping program. It is, however, identical in terms of the, the way it was built. Uh, it's a Geocortex Essentials platform, doesn't matter. The point is, they're the same. And so any data from the Atlas can be shown on BioFinder. Any data from BioFinder can be shown on the Atlas. The Atlas is the clearinghouse of all data that the Agency of Natural Resources maintains. That means its information architecture, the way it's set up, is by department. So it's very difficult to, uh, unless you know what data you're looking for, to find your way easily through the Atlas. Uh, it was intended to, to house data under the people that were responsible for maintaining that data. So in that sense, the architecture makes sense, 
but it does make it cumbersome for uh, representatives and the public uh, to access that data. So BioFinder is a slimmed down version. There are only 22 data sets on BioFinder. That is intentional to get you the most important information about biological diversity and climate resilience without a lot of noise. It's further, the BioFinder website is further designed to be as transparent as possible about what was selected and why. Uh, and I'll show you some of those uh, some of those tricks here in a moment. Um, so I mentioned that uh, the Vermont Conservation Design data uh, on BioFinder is a prioritization. It is uh, uh, we show those priorities at two different scales: the landscape scale and the community and species scale. Uh, now the move towards the landscape scale is an important one because over time, the conservation efforts uh, nationwide really have moved from an understanding of conservation as hotspot conservation, small places surrounded by development, to understanding a larger pattern, uh, contiguous forests, connected forests. And so that pattern is increasingly important uh, for the conservation of our fish and wildlife. Uh, and so understanding that pattern is critically important. Uh, towns, uh, RPCs, regional planning commissions, tend to zoom in to their level of regulatory authority, which is fine, except the ecological world doesn't necessarily recognize those boundaries. So being able to zoom out and see that ecological context at the landscape scale it is critically important. We just need to keep uh, teaching Vermonters what that means, because when you see a map with an awful lot of green on it, it means something different at the landscape scale than it might at, at finer scales. So Vermont Conservation Design has two different scales, and it's broken out into two different uh, priority ranks. Uh, VCD uh, assigns an overall priority rank highest priority for the lands and waters most important for maintaining ecological function. So that, that piece, maintaining ecological function, is critically important because it suggests a suite of uses that are appropriate where we can still have that land use and maintain ecological function. It does not suggest thou shalt not do anything in the dark green. That is, a, that is not the correct interpretation at the landscape scale, but we do need to work to find those compatible uses. Um, <clears throat> as we zoom in to Vermont Conservation Design, oh, please. Really has a question. So uh, we need to work to find those, what was it, what was it that you just said? Uses? Compatible. Compatible, compatible uses. uses. Define work? What do we need to do to find those compatible uses? Please. Uh, well, it depends on the, the, the place, uh, what ecological values are present, and therefore how you can manage those for ecological function. So to determine what a compatible use is, in a floodplain, for example. Um, I would maintain, personally speaking, development is not appropriate in the floodplain. That would, in my mind, be an incompatible use. Uh, but perhaps recreational fields would be a compatible use in that, given that ecological value. Whereas deep in the middle of a forest block, I would say housing and big development would be an inappropriate use. On parts of the edge of that forest block, housing development could be absolutely important, absolutely appropriate. I don't want to, I'm going to interrupt you. I don't want to, I don't want to be rude, but um, so my question, I heard you say we need to do work, which means to take, for me, I'm hearing, that means we need to take an action. And <clears throat> I, I'm sure you're aware we're looking at a bill, which is not what you're testifying on. You're talking, you're telling us about a resource for us. Um, and so that taking of that action I hear work. Is that what you meant? We need to take an action or some actions, and then kind of who is taking that action? And I apologize. This is uh, fairly new for me. This is new. this is my first year on this committee. So, uh, well, we're certainly getting to the heart of the issue uh, because uh, the land use is defined at the local level, is regulated. Land use planning and regulation are done at the local level. 
Um, so as long as that's the case, then 268 municipalities need to be doing some work. But I also think there's room at the legislat legislative level to understand what compatible uses uh, might be and how we can maintain that pattern into the future. So we need to do some work would mean collectively we, Vermont, is that what you mean? Yes, ma'am. Our municipalities. So it's more in a general sense. Yeah. Great. Thank you. My favorite town. Uh, it, it just so happens. Um, <laughs> but it was a great example. Uh, so I didn't, uh, I didn't just choose it for you, uh, but also uh, because it's a great example. So when we zoom in on BioFinder to, uh, to, to a particular town, again, you see the, the dark green, the highest priority area, and the light green. I just really want to emphasize that Vermont conservation design is a, is a cohesive whole. It's a design. We can break it up into its components, but each of those components are intended to work together. So I have great confidence in the dark green area on this map as being uh, uh, especially important uh, for our future to maintain into ecological function. So I will show you how to break this up into component parts, but I really want to stress how those parts, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Representative Sebelia. So should we think about every aspect of that green as holding equal importance? Or, you know, as our, we're looking at, uh, or as a place where we should be looking, well, you know, I'll just leave it there. Should we hold every, asp every piece of that green as equally important? And I'm looking at the 30 by 30 bill and the 50 by 50 bill asking you that question. Yeah, I, I understand. Um, there, that's really interesting because it, uh, there are a lot of different scales, uh, but, uh, and there are different components. So what an interior forest is going to mean is, is we're talking about different things on the edge of an interior forest versus the middle of the interior forest. So no, strictly speaking, not every inch of the dark green highest priority area is of exactly equal importance. That said, all of it has been elevated to the highest priority level. And so all of it does carry a great deal of weight. But I'm just trying to convey that nuance. There are differences in the edge of a forest or the middle of a forest, the edge of a floodplain or the middle of the floodplain. So, uh, so as we're looking at our bill, is that a place to find uh, to find places that we want to designate, or is that the place? Maybe that's a better way of saying. So, when I was asking, are they all equal? Like, is that is that it? Is that like, do we need to hold on to all of those, or is that the place where we want to be prioritizing holding on to? Uh, from my standpoint, in terms of ecological function, this is the network that we may need to maintain all of it. That said, again, when we're managing for ecological function, there are different land uses that can, can coexist. So I'm, I'm just trying to be very clear that, that no one thinks that I'm suggesting we need to, in perpetuity, conserve no development on all of the highest priority area. I think it's more subtle than that. Yep. Thank you. And I appreciate the, I appreciate the taking this time with the questions. I find these tools to be really helpful for me. And, but as I said, these are new kind of concepts. So I really want to understand what we're doing here. Great. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so as we, as we think about, uh, I've zoomed into Middlebury. And, and so we want to start by just understanding the larger pattern here. Uh, so what's the larger pattern? You look on the east side of town, uh, and there's a, a large area of highest priority. Okay, got it, one chunk on the east. If you look on the west side of town, so the northwest and the southwest are two more fairly large chunks of, of dark green. Okay, so we're getting a sense of the overall pattern. Please don't lose sight of the middle. All of the dark green in the middle is what's connecting those pieces together. That's part, that's an integral part of that overall pattern. So we can I begin just where is their highest priority? Where isn't there? 
And we can just start with that assessment and we see large, large pieces of this town in that designation. But I also wanna call your attention to those connecting features. They may be smaller, uh, narrower, but they're critically important because of their landscape context. I'll get more into this in a moment. So when you open, and perhaps you are following along, if you are in the BioFinder uh, web app, at left, you will see uh, this list of layers. And so you can uh, turn them on or off. There are also groups of layers, so you can expand the group or contract it. So please see that at left, I have the overall priorities, the landscape scale uh, turned on, and that's all we're seeing right now. So when you, when you just do a left click, or if you're on an iPad, just a quick touch on your screen anywhere on the dark green, a, um, oh yeah, a, uh, a, a box will come up. And that box tells you what, uh, what components are present. Why did that area get flagged as highest priority? This, uh, this portion of town in the, on the eastern side was flagged as highest priority for interior forest blocks, connectivity blocks, physical landscape diversity. So just those are the components at play in that part of town. Okay, let's click down. Oh, um, so then if we want to learn more about what those components mean, uh, each of those dark, each of the, the blue on, the, on that screen, each of those are, are links to the component abstracts. So that's gonna tell you in general, what is an interior forest? What does that mean? Why are those ecologically important? And how exactly were they selected? So I say selected, there are 4,052 forest blocks in Vermont. The interior forest component is a subset of that universe of forest blocks. So how did we go from 4,000 to whatever it is, 300? Um, the, the component abstract explains all of that, but it explains it at the interior forest level, meaning all interior forests, uh, but it explains how that was done. So as we continue clicking around Middlebury, uh, learning more about the components that are, are present, we might click uh, in, the, in the South Central there and learn that that particular area was flagged because it's a, a physical landscape block uh, and the physical landscape characteristics. Um, I'll explain those in a moment, but here I'm not talking about the biological world, I'm talking about the physical world, the bedrock, the slopes, the uh, topography. Um, which there's incredible correlation between bedrock and biological diversity. So it's, a, it's an actually a fantastic surrogate and really important for climate resilience, but I digress. Um, so, uh, and then when you click at left, uh, you know, the, the area I selected was uh, the surface waters and riparian areas. Riparian is streamside vegetation um, and also riparian wildlife connectivity. So we're getting a sense that there are different suites of components at play in different parts of town. Suites of components. So interior forests and connectivity blocks to the east, uh, surface waters and riparian areas throughout town, uh, physical landscape blocks to the south. There are suites of components. And so that's an important concept because if I had chosen a town on the spine of the Green Mountains, uh, it would be overwhelmingly forested and that the suite of components would be much more forest oriented. When you go into the Champlain Valley, you get a lot more interaction with surface waters and riparian uh, features. So different suites of components. There are grasslands, uh, important for grassland bird habitat in the Champlain Valley that aren't particularly effective at the upper elevations. So different suites of components in different places. Um, then I can also uh, turn on the species and community scale components to get a sense of hotspots. Some of many of these are hotspots within that landscape scale network. So you can think of these as places in the network that are the network, the dark green landscape scale, highest priority, that's the network I'm talking about. You can think of these as adding value to parts of the network where there are multiple uh, ecological values present at the same place. Um, some of these species and community scale elements do not occur in the network. Uh, it could be a, a population of rare plants that's in a, 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 you know, in a disturbed area in a more developed part of town. Um, 
I'm just trying to express some of the messiness of the natural world that not all of our, of our ecological priorities fall within this network, landscape scale network of forest blocks. And some of the rare species work we need to do will happen outside of that. Grasslands, uh, grassland bird habitat is outside of that forested network. So the dark green landscape scale priorities gets us the vast majority of species uh, protection, but it doesn't uh, get us everything. There are some species that are going to fall through those cracks and still need to be uh, looked at one by one. So that's that's an important note here is these are the landscape scale is a coarse filter. It tells us the big picture of what's most important. We will find efficiency in our conservation by focusing on that network. We'll get more species, more bang for our area buck by looking at that network first. But that is not the extent of what we can conserve. We need to also focus on rare species, elements that, that occur outside of the network as well. Uh, I will assure you that's the vast majority are captured within the network. So um, for clarity, I'm just going to turn off the landscape scale and just keep on the species and community scale. So you see dark, uh, a blue and a purple. Um, and, uh, and so I just wanted to show you, first and foremost, there's large circles, uh, always a red flag in the ecological world. Um, and those uh, circles, uh, chances are, refer to rare, threatened, and endangered species. And the fact that it's a circle has to do with the way the heritage programs, program maps those components. Uh, and, and some species, we're, we're uh, applying significant buffers uh, because they move around. Um, so that... So those circles speak to how the data was created. It, it doesn't reflect the exact habitat of that species uh, at that location. Um, so we can see that there are rare species at play here in Middlebury for sure. I also highlighted a wetland there in the middle. Um, and I'm just showing you how the map tips guide by start telling you which components are at play, whether you're at the landscape level or the species and community level. I'm making room. <laughs> yeah, great. Any questions? Uh, no. Okay. Thank you. So, great though. Um, so I've said this before, and forgive me, I'm just going to repeat, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, so I really want to underscore the importance of the overall network. Um, but I'm now going to show you that we can break this up into those individual components. And so we can see what uh, one component at a time what the distribution looks like across the state and at a particular town. At the landscape scale, we identify interior forests, connectivity blocks, physical landscape blocks, surface water and riparian area network, riparian wildlife connectivity. At the community scale, uh, we're looking at natural communities, aquatic habitats, wetlands, vernal pools, wildlife road crossings, and rare and uncommon species. So the, this in total is the, the, the Vermont conservation design. These are the, the, the overall uh, priority areas. Um, so when you look at BioFinder, please let me just jump up and down. The, the overall components in that top left corner, those are the same as the individual components in right uh, in the box below it. So you can see them one by one in the individual components in the red section, or you can see them all together as overall priorities in the top. So any spot of land that was flagged as highest priority for any one of those components will then get bumped up into the overall priorities section. So a particular spot that was flagged for interior, highest priority interior forest, that ranking comes through and it shows up as highest priority dark green at the overall level. Those are the same. We, that there's, there's, been, there's no change there. We're just showing, we can show it to you as an overall network or we can show it to you component by component. Um, so let me just go quickly through, and I believe you've I've heard testimony from Mr. Zeno, who uh, spoke to each of these components as well. I'm not going to, uh, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I just I thought it might be useful just to hear these again. The components uh, at the landscape scale, interior forest, we're talking about deep dark woods, uh, where we get the, the most species uh, 
uh, uh, from a conservation planning standpoint. Um, these areas are important for climate resilience, for air and water protection. These are, again, a subset of all of the habitat blocks that are out there. The connectivity blocks are a different subset of all of the habitat blocks, forest blocks that are out there. Some of them are the same as interior forests and some of them are not. So they are two different subsets of, of the overall habitat blocks. But connectivity blocks are the, the places in Vermont where we, uh, uh, the, a selection of forest blocks that uh, essentially allow for <clears throat> wildlife movement and ecological process movement from the Berkshires to the Suttons, the Whites to the Adirondacks, uh, and everything in between. That's the connected network of forest blocks. So when you look at the pattern in yellow orange on the screen, that is a connected pattern. And so that's its, its most important function is that it is a connected pattern. So that's a different type of selection than for interior forests, as an example. Um, surface waters and riparian areas, difficult to see at this scale, but this is every single stream and river uh, in, in the state. Um, and, uh, and then a subset of those surface waters and riparian areas where there's actual intact vegetation along the streams and rivers is called uh, riparian wildlife connectivity because that allows for terrestrial movement beside the stream and the river. So where there's intact vegetation beside the stream, that's better ecological function uh, than without. Um, so that those areas are, are flagged as riparian wildlife connectivity. Um, and so here, uh, I believe uh, this must be uh, Shelburne, the Shelburne South Burlington line, uh, where you see um, uh, uh, Shelburne Bay. Um, and so I'm just showing you that there's uh, that um, there's a subset of, of the area that's riparian wildlife connectivity compared to the overall mass of surface water. Uh, physical landscape blocks are. Um, are, are, are a type of forest block that were chosen because of physical landscape diversity. The entire highest priority network was uh, assessed for physical landscape diversity. And there are some places in that highest priority network where we didn't capture all of the, the geological settings uh, that are present statewide in Vermont. And so we added in a few forest blocks to ensure that there was representation of every geologic uh, landform setting uh, that we have in the state. So as we think about climate resilience, as we think about looking into the future, all of our species are going to change. So how do you predict where there's biological diversity in the future? Where we have diversity in the physical landscape today will have biological diversity into the future. It might be a sassafras, sassafras tulip tree forest, you know, some of the, the, the uh, um, mid-Atlantic forests uh, moving up in, in several hundred years, but those are still gonna be places of diversity relative to the surrounding landscape. So this physical, the analysis of physical landscape diversity in BioFinder is critically important to your understanding of, of climate resilience and where we'll have biological diversity into the future. Okay, then there are a variety of species and community scale components. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I just wanted to make sure I'd, I'd flag them all. Um, that, uh, again, they're hot spots. They're often inside the network. They're occasionally outside the network. Um, you have heard the term conservation targets in the past. I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page about that term. So conservation targets uh, has a very specific meaning on the BioFinder website. It refers to a suite of targets for old forest, young forest, shrublands, and grasslands uh, that we were trying, we, we set a goal, a target, for how much of these different conditions do we want on the landscape to maintain ecological function. You could also say that all of Vermont conservation design is the conservation target uh, for Vermont. How much is enough? Uh, what are the places that are most important? So you can think of the entirety of the network as a target, uh, but that term has a very specific meaning on BioFinder where we're just talking old forest, young forest, shrublands, and grasslands. 
we map these separately because some of these features are outside of the network. Some of these features we don't necessarily know. Uh, it moves from year to year where there's young forest, for example. So targets were set that are outside of the mapped uh, network. So again, I'm just being clear, the word conservation target has a couple different meanings here. Um, I also wanted to point you to, uh, we're getting deep in the weeds now in BioFinder, but in the top left, uh, there's, uh, there's a theme. And when you first load BioFinder, it says prioritization in that top left. There are other themes. Uh, inventory is a theme. That's all the raw data. Every single habitat block in Vermont shows up on the inventory side of things. Um, there's another theme called the social and environmental factors theme that was just developed. It includes the entirety of the social vulnerability index uh, created by the Department of Health. It includes the parcelization database uh, created by Vermont Natural Resources Council. And it includes in a few other uh, spatially explicit uh, data layers. But it gives you insight into uh, poverty levels, education levels, insurance levels, uh, a number of, of uh, people in, uh, uh, in high density development in, in housing and in apartment buildings, uh, essentially. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of social data that's also viewable on the BioFinder website. Uh, it tells us a lot about uh, equity uh, and diversity, uh, but I just wanted to be clear that all of that information is viewable along with the conservation plan of Vermont Conservation Design. Uh, so we can begin, as I work with communities across the state, I learn more about those communities in terms of some of those social metrics uh, so that we can better match the, uh, the conservation tools we're suggesting with the, uh, um, with the ecological values and that larger pattern. Representative Sebelia. Can you give an example um, of how you connect so the social vulnerability index to this map? Uh, land value in Craftsbury has gone up more than 2,000% since uh, 2004. Um, that's a, a, an alarming statistic for residents there who would like to see their children live in the same town that they live in. Um, so when I present about ecological uh, features in Craftsbury, uh, mentioning statistics like that helps understand why guiding the pattern of development might be helpful to that community. Another example, I believe uh, uh, Representative Ram uh, had said that, uh, what is it? Um, uh, mobile home residents make up uh, a, a small fraction of the, overall, uh, of the overall housing stock in Vermont, and yet we're disproportionately affected by Hurricane Irene. Um, so as we think about environmental justice and being able to understand the connection between environmental values and the people that live there, data sets like this can be incredibly helpful. So <clears throat> maybe I'm mis maybe I'm misunderstanding, and I apologize. I have a tickle in my throat, and I don't want to be coughing in here. That's really <laughs> much. Um, are you connecting the social um, vulnerability and the ecological factors maps? They are viewable at the same time. Okay, but you're not making a connection. Not in any map, and not in any uh, data sense, no. That was yep, so they're viewable at the same time. So folks that are responsible for land use planning in those communities can understand both realities. Awesome, thank you. And I'm gonna actually ask you if you wouldn't mind going back a slide, because this came up in our conversation the other day. And you have a great map here that shows the biophysical regions of the state. And then you've called out what the targets are in, in these boxes. And I just want members to take note of that. And then maybe if you could walk us through one or two of those examples, like. Um, uh, sure, there are, so there are targets for old forests and young forests that are set at, I believe the biophysical region scale. So how much young forest do we need in certain biophysical region? How much old forest do we need in certain biophysical regions? So the, the targets, the goals are set. Uh, and so we imagine those goals would be met within the, the, 
the highest priority network in that uh, in that region because it, it would include the vast majority of forested land in that region. But uh, different parts of Vermont have different amounts of young forest, just as one example. So it was appropriate to set different targets uh, for different. Uh, different biophysical regions. Uh, grasslands, uh, you know, are really uh, much more productive in the Champlain Valley and, and in the uh, Connecticut River Valley. Uh, and so we set targets for what uh, percentage of grassland and, and shrubland habitats uh, would be ideal in uh, statewide uh, to meet in those different biophysical regions. Uh, those targets would largely be met outside of the highest priority uh, network that's overwhelmingly forested. Okay, so some members know each of these maps of the state are, are different kind of targeted types. So young and old forest, shrublands and grasslands going across. You could think of the interior forest selection also as a target. Uh, and component and the connectivity blocks as a target. Uh, how much is enough? In, in those cases, we were able to actually map those uh, with you know, choosing specific blocks because forest is persistent. In the case of shrublands, uh, we didn't choose specific spots. Those are ephemeral. So in the case of interior forests, are they, um, it's the map that you showed us of the important habitat blocks. That is the area that we feel is target. most important. Right, that is the target. Yes. Thank you. Do people, do folks understand that? No. Nope. <laughs> Sorry, was that a- Why we're dwelling on it a little bit. Yeah. It's a uh, new concept for us, yeah. for a lot of us. So, so, you, I'm, I'm, so in looking at these and looking at uh, the first map- Forgive me, you're looking at the targets now, old and young forest targets? I yeah. believe, I'm looking at this. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So uh, in these, uh, target is, uh, how is the target set? Uh, it depends on the component, but it's, uh, it's what the, the total amount of land area that we feel is, is necessary to maintain, we, the Fish and Wildlife Department okay. and the Agency of Natural Resources Steering Committee that created Vermont Conservation Design. These are the areas that we feel are most important uh, to maintain into the, into the future. So how much is enough? Uh, we're trying to answer that question. Okay. So these are targets. So I'm looking at uh, the top one, North, North Eastern Highlands, Young Forest, 5%, 22,000 acres, Old Forest, 59,000 acres. So there's where's a the lot target? Of, there's a, both of those are targets. And where is how much? So what? Those two acreages are the how much. That's the target. We don't know how much is that conserved. That's part of what we're trying to get at in 30 by 30. Yeah, forgive me. This is not about conserv this is not about permanent land conservation. This is about how much of that particular uh, 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 habitat type do we have, or or do we think is most appropriate to maintain ecological function? So There's a tremendous amount of young forest in the northeastern highlands already, and so the target is lower than in other biophysical regions. So it's twenty two thousand acres is what is there. No, ma'am. 22,000 acres is, is the target. That's how much we think is enough to maintain that function. In that biophysical region. Physical region. What's the 5% in that box? Uh, wasn't that early successional forest? Young forest. Young forest. forest. That's the target. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm still not there. With okay. You. okay. So, so the top box, Northeastern Highlands, Young Forest. Oh, Northeastern Highlands. Is That's the biophysical region. region. That's the area. Biophysical region. Young forest, 5% in parentheses, 22,000 acres. Yep. That's the target. That is. 5% of what? 5% of the forested area uh, in that region should be target. young forest. Okay. And old forest, <clears throat> no target listed. No okay. Listed. No 59,000 acres. 59,000. So why do we have a percentage? And in on the younger forest and not on the old forest. Uh, I don't know the that's answer to that question. I would suggest that that I would guess that that's because 
early successional forest is ephemeral. It 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 grows up, uh, and so it's there's a it's it's difficult to quantify uh, exactly. You know when when does it stop being young forest and become uh, mature forest? Uh, that's on a spectrum. So it, in cases, it's easier to maintain a percentage uh, than it is to have an exact acreage. Okay, I'm gonna I, I think maybe I have it. So uh, the target in the northeastern highlands for young forest is five percent. We have. You're gonna tell me it's the target. I'm going to tell you it's the target. The, that box is not going to tell you uh, how many acres of forest we have in the Northeastern Highlands. Okay, I, I, so the 5%, I don't understand why we have one list as a percentage and not the other. Oh, yeah, and, and forgive me, I don't have a great answer for you on that other than young forest is ephemeral. And so it is very difficult to maintain, to have, does that precise, mean it grows up, it changes. Uh, and, um, and, and so it is very difficult to capture what the exact acreage is of young forest because it depends who, uh, uh, how young you are. Okay. Who's this most useful for, this map? Uh, the conservation community, um, having an understanding of the mix of of, um, of uh, the mix of age stands, uh, so foresters, uh, conservationists, uh, the agency. Um, so the Vermont Conservation Design is attempting to bring the entire conservation community onto the same page, uh, and so there are parts of it that are going to be more useful to landowners and less useful to landowners. Um. We'll just say that uh, I think we've spent enough time on this, but I'm not quite. Uh, so I'm not there. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, it's great that you're doing all this stuff to conserve, but uh, before the state and the feds built great big roads up through the Northeast Kingdom, the woods were pretty well conserved because nobody could get through them. And if they were left alone, they would keep reproducing and doing what they're supposed to be doing, probably on their own. So what's the point of this mass confusion that you've got on the wall there? Well, sir, I, I don't see the roads going away anytime soon. Oh, I don't either. They'll uh, probably be paved in a few years. And, and I actually see the roads as a, as a vector for, for growth and further development and increased fragmentation. Uh, so it, it seems to me that we need to map these areas and understand ecological function given the current context. So you're suggesting that we do for more fragmentation up uh, up there, is that what I just heard? No, sir. The roads that have been developed for fragmentation? Uh, I, I don't entirely understand your point, sir. I heard. No, I, I, think, I think Representative Smith is probably thinking of roads that were built by the state up in the county. Yeah. Okay. Well, not all roads are, are the same. Uh, so, uh, you know, roads within state-owned land are going to have a very different effect uh, and, and ramifications than roads on private land. Uh, roads within uh, state lands are, are not going to be vectors for increased development, um, nor are they likely to be as wide and well-maintained as, uh, as public access. Uh, and so a lot of the uh, environmental damages that go hand in hand with roads are less present in those places uh, than they would be on Route 2, for example. Uh, route two, the more roadside you clear, the less canopy there is. And so the more it's an effective barrier where there's a real difference between the roadside habitat and the forest. Uh, when trees are directly beside the road and it's an eight foot wide road, uh, the canopy closes and it's a very different environment than, uh, than, than a public, uh, public it, access. Would you say it's a better environment? Uh, uh, when the canopy closes over the roads? A better environment for whom? Conservation of land. Uh, well, yes, sir. I would suggest that uh, that having a more intact forest is, is better for the natural world. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I uh, just wanted to, uh, to uh, give you all a sense of how Vermont conservation design is being applied statewide. Uh, BioFinder was first created in 2012. Uh, Vermont conservation design was first created in 20, 
2015. We did an update the species and community scale layers in 2018. We are currently uh, redoing Vermont conservation design uh, with a grant from the US Fish and Wildlife Service that will be done by the end of this year. Um, the BioFinder website and Vermont conservation design are, are critically important for land use planning at the municipal level. That is my day slash night job uh, of, of working with communities and in, in interpreting these data for them and, and scaling it down to those towns. Uh, Vermont conservation design is critically important for uh, establishing priorities for land conservation, not only within the agency of natural resources, but across the entire conservation community. Land trusts uh, frequently cite uh, Vermont conservation design as a reason for conserving a particular parcel and will list the components within that are present in that parcel as further justification for why conservation would be necessary. Uh, Vermont conservation design is part of uh, state lands management and plays a role in how we understand what we manage for and where. Um, uh, the, there are partnerships at the uh, eco-regional level, like the Staying Connected Initiative, that focus on habitat connectivity across the entire northern Appalachians. Uh, our science, forgive me if I'm a little biased, our science is better than any other states I've seen. Uh, and so we use our science uh, when, when we're involved in partnerships like that. Uh, and we use Vermont conservation design as the priority area for staying connected partnership that operates within Vermont. Um, the uh, Governor Scott is a signatory to the New England Governors and Eastern Canadian Premier's uh, Connectivity Resolution uh, 40-3. Uh, and so uh, Vermont Conservation Design pro fo uh, uh, featured prominently in that effort as an example of the kind of uh, statewide wall-to-wall -wall science that, that governs uh, what connectivity looks like. Um, we use uh, uh, Vermont Conservation Design in our, uh, in our work on Section 248 review and also in, uh, it provides context in Act 250 review. Uh, so there are a variety of uh, ways that VCD has been used over the years and, and continues to be actively used and helps sets the trajectory for the agency and for the conservation community across the board. Um, I, I just mentioned the Staying Connected initiative and I just wanted to highlight that effort uh, because <clears throat> it features a multi-pronged approach, which I might suggest is the blueprint for what conservation should look like moving forward. Uh, it's not enough to have one element of this multi-pronged approach. In my opinion, the coordination between the prongs of this approach is, is critically important. So there are different spheres, of, there, there are different spheres, conservation science, land protection, land use planning, road barrier mitigation, the transportation systems piece. Different partners work in those different spheres and they focus intently on those spheres. And yet you can get incredible conservation uh, success by coordinating between those pieces. So when VTRANS invests in transportation infrastructure that helps move wildlife, well, the land use planning, the land use planners can pick up and, and plan for that area to be low density. The land protection partners can pick up on that hub of infrastructure and start uh, working with landowners about conservation easements to maintain that network in perpetuity. So the coordination between the parts of the multi-pronged approach is, in my opinion, even more important in this day and age than any one of the individual prongs. Um, so uh, I'll just, uh, I'm just going to give you a few examples of how that plays out. Uh, I do a lot of work with Act 171, the forced integrity bill uh, that requires towns to identify their forest blocks and connectors. Uh, and so this, uh, for every town plan written since 2018, has to include that, those concepts. Um, so we can use Vermont conservation design, this is Waitsfield, we can use conservation design to select those forest blocks, to select, select those connectors, to select those wildlife road crossings, uh, to help towns build those Act 171 related maps. Um, this is a review. Representative Spiel, can you go back? Thank you. So looking at this map, which is, really helpful in helping us understand where we want to conserve. <clears throat> How, someone who, so the state, we have a 
priority to build housing. So how would this map most um, be most helpful uh, in expediting the building of housing? The town of Waitsfield uh, engaged in my services because they wanted to uh, do a housing overlay district uh, for exactly that reason, to, to uh, focus on, on housing in, in town uh, and particularly uh, affordable housing at, at uh, close to Route 100 where public transportation was possible. Um, but to do that well, they wanted to know where their forest blocks are so they could keep that new housing out of those forest blocks. So they asked me to help work with their planning commission and conservation commission to fine tune those forest block selections uh, as and help understand the relative priority levels of different forest blocks within their town such that their housing overlay could be maximized to or i say minimized uh, could minimize uh, ecological uh, uh, ramifications uh, and uh, and and still get the housing they're looking for so is that something that, I mean, is that like a one-off type project? Is that something that we can do at a state level? Uh, well, it, certainly the state could choose to do uh, statewide land use planning. Well, I mean, we have a statewide concert. So we, we're looking at maps that show where conservation, priority areas are for conservation. When we build housing, we want to build housing not necessarily exacerbating this, we want to still conserve land. So could we add another layer on here? I mean, we've got social vulnerability. Could we add another layer here about suitability for housing in terms of conservation? Uh, well, uh, I would suggest that the areas not in the highest priority network would be the first place to look uh, for, for housing. And so uh, we're also trying to so could we add that as a layer on here? So we are also looking at building in places where there are existing downtowns, um, designated downtowns, et cetera. So this, this date, these data are, are attempting to be the best science we can offer. Uh, this is not the land use plan. Um, this is the, the conservation values. And to come up with the land use plan and what we think the future should look like, they're all manner of trade-offs. Uh, and so I think those trade-offs are, are more complicated than one particular agency. So I would suggest that putting the putting this uh, putting housing uh, some layer like housing uh, suitability on this map, uh, would would need to be a lot bigger than just the agency, uh, and right now is controlled at the local level. Okay, so one-offs for towns is something that we could. <coughs> that is uh, what I do. That's what you do. I assist towns with exactly that. Okay, are you the only person that does that at the agency? Uh, it depends how you mean. Uh, I'm the, uh, my, my program is the only one in, in the Fish and Wildlife Department that provides municipal technical assistance. So how long would it take a municipality to be able to work with you? Uh, it very much depends on the municipality. Uh, forgive me, I'm not trying to hedge my bets here, but it, it very much depends on the municipality. Uh, some are, are much more functional uh, than others. Uh, and so can move quicker and others, you know, meet once a month and things move slowly. Uh, so a year, two years. To, okay, for a town to. But I mean, it would take years for the average town to get to the place where they are ready. There, it just, there's a long arc to town, uh, town land use planning. Okay. Although I think what I heard, Representative Sevilla asking was, how many towns can you work with at a time? Oh. Something more like that, like what, do we need more yens out there in the world? Um, I, uh, I do direct technical assistance to uh, my program, does direct technical assistance to about 35 communities uh, every year. Uh, we reach more like 100, 125 communities <coughs> each year uh, through a combination of webinars and so forth. So there's ongoing education of towns, but then there's also access for when they're updating their town plan. Well, and, and the work that happened with Waitsfield was Waitsfield that you talked about the housing. I mean, that to me seems pretty key 
for meeting, you know, our, our goals around conservation and adding new housing. And so I'm wondering if there's a limitation on the types of services that would allow us to do both. And so I'm hearing you are the person. Well, the, a lot of towns are, are working without my assistance, but there is a lack of capacity at the municipal level. Uh, we, uh, we as a state are assigning more and more responsibility to our municipalities, and some have capacity, excellent capacity, and, and others do not. Uh, and so the sort of rift uh, between towns that are, are capable of moving on a bunch of different fronts and towns that aren't uh, is increasing, in my opinion. Yes. Yeah. Representative Morris. Come on up here. Aren't the regional planning commissions involved with this as well? For the <clears throat> Absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing that up. They are the premier technical assistance deliverers uh, for all, every town in Vermont. Uh, <clears throat> so my uh, work tends to be more specialized on interpreting the data, but they are absolutely the experts in uh, writing a town plan and the, the regulatory language of subdivision or, or zoning or whatever it might be. And I think in helping with what you're getting at, that interface, mm -hmm. balancing all the conflicting interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that we're doing good Both. things instead of bad things Both. and quickly. <laughs> Representative Dory. Yeah, that, that was my question too about like the housing overlay district that you mentioned. You might not reflect that anywhere on BioFinder, but that map and that mapping exercise will be captured somewhere. Like the RPC has GIS ability and they, so the, that housing layer, the, that type of stuff will exist and be accessible. Why is that well, it just? Um, because it's part of, it can be part of a larger plan, like a regional plan. What's in their zoning? Their yeah. zoning will be mapped. Yes, ma'am. It also shows up in their town plan. Yeah. Right. So when those maps get created, they, they're public, they live as a data layer somewhere. So maps for housing exist already. Overlay districts like that. They already exist. They do. Maps for housing. I, I, there's zoning maps. But the thing so, that doesn't exist that I think is missing that used to exist was our town plans. We were required to have a... Um, identified areas for affordable housing and that requirement went away. So that's something that's been well, We're digressing and running out of time, but I would also suggest to you that this, so I'm going to go back to the very beginning because Jens mentioned to us, there's BioFinder, Finder, but then there's the Atlas, which has all of the data. It has water and sewer data mapped. It has kind of the much broader um, <coughs> look. You can, and I think it would be helpful this morning we took testimony about how um, small the area where we want housing is, and I would argue the area where we actually have housing is quite large because when you put the E911 addresses up on any of these maps, <laughs> you will see that this, th these forest blocks are, you know, perforated by houses in a very significant way in many places. Um, Madam Chairwoman. Uh I, I am blowing your agenda. Um, I think we have a little bit of room in the agenda. So I, this is good. This is really important. OK, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, we do a review of town plans and bylaws every 10 years. Uh, we often work with Vermont Natural Resources Council. And I just wanted to flag that in the 2022 uh, review of all town plans and uh, zoning and bylaws, uh, we found that there's a significant uh, increase in inclusion of forest integrity related issues in our town plans across the board. Uh, you can see that the numbers are in the 70s, high 70s and 80s for the percent of town plans that mention those, uh, those resources. So in the last 10 years, uh, the towns have really pivoted to understand these issues. Uh, please also note that the, the, the detail with which the town plans are described describing forest blocks and connectors uh, in terms of map layer is, is lagging behind. Uh, and so in general, there's a rift between the aspirational language that you see in the town plans and the regulatory framework that might actually um, uh, maintain or protect those resources into the future. Uh, so there's a lot of, of good language in the town plans. They set the vision for the future, uh, but they don't necessarily uh, con constrain uh, development. 
Um, and and then I'll just show that uh, you know the zoning is very common as one tool, as is subdivision, uh, very common in Vermont, but it is not wall to wall. Uh, I believe the percentage is I should have written this down. I think 80 86 percent statewide of towns that have zoning. It, it's something in that region, um, and yet the quality of that zoning can uh, vary dramatically. So I just wanted to point out that it, it, the regulatory uh, landscape is not at all consistent uh, across the state. Um, as you look at particular zoning districts, uh, I'll just flag that there are, you know, a lot of towns are, are using conservation districts and forest districts uh, with some efficacy towards, uh, towards wildlife and, and fragmentation standards. Uh, natural resource overlay districts and wildlife districts are not used as much, but are, uh, are in my view, more effective at, uh, at maintaining those, those values. And, uh, and then I'll just flag that uh, the, the rural or ag resource districts are, uh, are very common, maybe omnipresent uh, in, in zoning, uh, and are very ineffective at uh, addressing these issues. So the vast majority of growth that happens in Vermont is happening in those ag and rural residential districts. So the sprawling development pattern that we see in Vermont largely happens in those districts. Um, I'll just finish up with an example of Bolton. Uh, and so I highlighted the town in, in blue. And as we look at the overall Vermont conservation design, you get a sense of how central Bolton is uh, to, to that to that design in, in, in this part of Vermont. Um, I worked with the community starting in 2012 uh, on uh, inventory, uh, doing a town specific inventory. And then they did a town plan in 2019 and did uh, rewrote their zoning in 2021. Uh, so speaking to the long time that it takes towns to get work done, uh, that work is over a, a decade. Uh, the planning, the, the work that went into that really did pay off. The zoning district, uh, excuse me, the zoning map that you see at left, uh, please let me just point out that uh, extreme eastern uh, dark green, uh, that's uh, the, the, their forestry district. And so relative to 2005, they expanded their forest and conservation districts and they brought it down the hill. Uh, and it lines up at right, you see the conserved land map. And please notice that there's a hole right near, right in between the two, uh, uh, the conserved land from Bolton and the conserved land in Duxbury. And the zoning actually fills that, that gap. So there's, uh, through their zoning, through the use of land protection and land use planning, there's continuous corridor uh, uh, that limits development north to south. So their conserved lands in Bolton lines up with the, the forest district in Bolton lines up with conserved lands in Duxbury. So conserved land is, is great. It's in perpetuity. Uh, 30 by 30 is, is very doable given the numbers we're at. But conserved land, uh, working with willing landowners to do easements does not get you land use pattern. It does not make a pattern across the state. It is by nature haphazard where there are willing landowners. And land trusts have been doing an excellent job of, of, of trying to uh, focus on ecological function and, and, and make sure that, that uh, the lands they accept as easements work for those values, but it doesn't get you pattern. Land use pattern, land use planning does get you that pattern. Uh, so again, the mix of tools, and that's why I'm talking about this multi-pronged approach. The mix of tools is, uh, is how you find viability into the future, in my opinion. Um, and I'll just bring this, uh, I just have a few more slides, but just wanted to be clear that transportation infrastructure is that even finer scale of where we can allow for different values, uh, where different networks uh, interact. Uh, and so as we think about Bolton, that zoning map where I just explained, I just want to show you one particular structure uh, or two structures. This is called Pineo Brook. And so that zoning district with that conserved land and then the zoning district also lines up with this culvert under I-89 and Route 2. Uh, it also lines up with this culvert, Sharkeyville. Uh, the 
Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department and the Agency of Transportation have been working together on road ecology and right sizing our structures across the state. When the Agency of Transportation builds new, it overwhelmingly accommodates aquatic organism passage and terrestrial movement. The problem has been that VTrans hasn't had uh, uh, enough money to replace new. My point here is, again, we're lining up the different prongs of the approach. We've got the land protection, the Camel Sump State Forest, the lands in Bolton. Then we have land use planning, the Bolton zoning districts. And now we have the pinch points and VTrans is currently scoping this Sharkeyville culvert, looking for alternatives to appropriately size it to allow for wildlife movement. So in this case, the land protection, the land use planning came first, the infrastructure hopefully is next. In other cases, we build the infrastructure first and the land use planning and the land protection come after that. So, uh, sorry that that was a wild, uh, wild roller coaster ride, but I, I hope you got something out of it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. That was very helpful for us. Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Madam Chair. I just wanted to clarify that culvert was too small. Yes. I don't yes. think you said that as clearly as you could. Forgive me. This is radically too small. Uh, this was 40 feet underwater in Hurricane Irene, and it shoots water about 40 feet straight out towards the Winooski. Uh, but it's under about 100 feet of fill, so it doesn't move. But everything around it might. Uh, further questions? That, that was really very helpful. Yeah, Representative. Um, I know you from the Conservation Commission world. It's a big resource. Um, I was curious about how many of our towns have conservation commissions. More than half uh, of Vermont towns have a conservation commission. Uh, we picked up two new ones last year uh, in um, Vernon and South Hero. Thank you again. Great, thank you. We're gonna take a five minute break.